All right, it's uh, one o'clock. Let's go and get started. Um, can I ask you? Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course you can ask a question after class. Uh, all right, uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, you know, first of all, let me thank you guys for your flexibility today. Um, you know, I uh, smelled gas in my house over the weekend and we found out there's a gas leak in my dryer. And so, uh, and today was kind of the only day that the that the repairman could come out. It was either today or next week. And so, you know, um, I am almost out of underwear, and so I need to do my laundry pretty soon. So, and you know, it's a bit rainy outside, so I can't really dry my laundry outside. So, you know, it's uh, I had to get it fixed today. So I appreciate you guys, um, you know, meeting virtually. Uh, you know, I know this. You know, we did this for a couple of years during the pandemic, and you know, we were starting to come back. But you know, just today I wanted to do virtual just so I can get my dryer fixed. And so, um, the repairman hasn't got here yet, so I, I might have to duck out suddenly um, at some point today if he rings the doorbell. Um, you know, with, with these kinds of things, they, they give you a time window. So my window was anywhere between noon and 4 p.m. And so, you know, if he, if he gets here during that time, I might have to just duck out just for a couple minutes just to let him in. But, you know, besides that, 
Uh, we'll conduct lecture as, as usual today. Okay, okay. and so uh, the plan for today is uh, we're going to continue on with our lecture notes on ethics. And so I think we introduced it last Tuesday. Uh, and so today we're going to dive into um, probably the most important topic in ethics, which is uh, health and safety. Okay. Um, regarding the midterm exam, um, I haven't started grading those yet, but I do plan on having those ready by Thursday. And so um, I'm going to probably start it today after after the lecture, and then on, uh, and then I'm going to spend most of tomorrow kind of finishing and grading those. And so you'll know what you get on Thursday, and I'll, I'll have them to return back to you guys in class on Thursday as well. So. Uh, you can look forward to, to that. Okay. All right. So the other thing I, I wanted to do today is I wanted to talk about the final project. Um, and so like I mentioned before, there's no final exam in this class, uh, but there is a fairly uh, extensive final project. Right? It's a group project. And so I wanted to go over kind of what that all is all about today, um, you know, just so you can start thinking about it and forming groups. And then, um, you know, and then after that, I'm going to talk about homework six, which is related to the final project as well. So today, you know, I think probably for the first half hour today, we'll probably be discussing just, uh, you know, the final project in homework six. Um, and then after that, we'll get back into the uh, lecture, the lecture notes on ethics. OK. All right. <clears throat> so that's, uh, um, you know, at least at least it for the beginning part of this class. You know, a lot of this class is going to be announcements in terms of, you know, final project and all that stuff. But are there any questions I can answer before we uh, get started for today? OK, all right. So let me go ahead and share my screen just so you can see what I'm looking at. So today uh, you might have noticed it already, uh, but I I posted the, uh, the specifications for the final project. And so you can uh, this document is available for you to read on Canvas. Uh, and so you can you can definitely you know download it and read it more carefully. But I did want to go over together with you as a class, um, just so that you can um, you know start to start to think about it. Okay. Okay. And so um, the final project is basically going to be a case study report, right? And so remember what we talked about last Tuesday is that you know the way I'm going to approach the ethics portion of this course is that um, you know it's going to be mostly. Um, Mostly case studies, and so we're going to and so we're going to learn about a lot of different, um, you know, a lot of different case studies out there. Uh, there's been a lot of instances of you know uh, engineering ethical misconduct, and also good stories of, of engineering um, ethics as well. And I want you to provide a detailed report on on one of those uh, in groups. Okay. Uh, I just noticed there's a little bit of typo here, so there's you're not going to be working groups of five, and so we do have a, a little bit of, sm of a smaller class than usual. Um, and so I think there's only 33 students in the class, and so you're going to be working groups of four. Okay, so five I think is a little bit too much. Okay, uh, and so you're going to be working together with the group of four, and then you're going to be compiling the content required for the report um, and presenting it in a single cohesive document. Okay, so there's there's basically two main deliverables, and so you're going to do a final presentation, and so that's going to take place during the last week of of the course, and then you're going to be doing writing a final report together as well. Okay. Um, and so the idea is that, you know, you're going to be, um, you know, first of all, reading about an engineering uh, ethical case study, and you're going to be analyzing it from the lens of, you know, everything we're learning about engineering ethics. Okay. Um, and so you're going to be um, looking at all the different, you know, uh, perspectives of the context. You're going to be looking at all the notable players, all the notable people, as well as the impacts of that ethical case study as well. Okay. Um, and the idea is that, you know, each group is going to handle a different case study as well. So, you know, um, part of this is, you know, you're going to be, you know, you're going to be doing your own research and learning a lot about a particular case study. But, you know, and during the last week when all the groups are presenting, you're going to be learning all about all of their case studies as well. OK, and so a lot of these and some of these are, are fairly high profile. And so you probably heard about a lot of these because they've made it to the news. Um, and so, you know, uh, for some of these, you know, I think it'll be an interesting chance to kind of dive deeper into, um, you know, a lot of those, a lot of those different case studies. Okay. Okay. Um, and so, you know, in terms of the groups, uh, I'm going to let you guys form your own groups. And so, um, you know, I know a lot of, it seems like a lot of, a lot of you in the class kind of know, kind of know each other already. And so, you know, usually those, those are the kind of the best um, people to work with the ones that you already know. And so feel free to form your own groups, but you know, if you, uh, if you you know either need maybe just one more person for your group or you know if if you uh, can't seem to find a group on your own just let me know and then i can i can kind of arrange it so that everyone is 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 in a group okay 
Uh, all right, and so that's the that's kind of the idea of the final project. And so, are there are there any questions on this? Okay, okay, all right. So that's the idea. So let's go ahead and jump into the requirements. Okay, um, and so you know, I think that the thing that I want to highlight the most about all these ethical case studies is that they're very very complex. And so, um, you know, some like I mentioned, you know, some of these you might have heard about either on the news. And you know those 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 situations may seem to be pretty cut and dry, but I think once you cut once you kind of dig a bit deeper into a lot of these uh, case studies, you'll see that there's a lot of nuance and a lot of complexity in terms of you know why certain people made decisions the way they did and why certain things happened the way they did as well. Okay, and so I want you basically the the idea is that I want you to take these case studies and analyze them from every possible angle or every possible perspective so that you can get kind of a full picture of you know, why it happened, okay? And so what you'll see is that I've organized the requirements into kind of like different different ways that you can look at the case study and then to analyze it from those perspectives, okay? So the first is historical context. Uh, and so from the historical context, I want you to discuss all kind of the major events that kind of led up to that, um, you know, led up to the ethical case study, okay? And so the idea is that, you know, no engineering product is ever taken up in a vacuum. And so there's always some kind of progression of events that kind of led up to that point, okay? And so some questions that you might consider is, you know, why, you know, first of all, why did the company engage in this project and what were they hoping to gain? You know, what were the major major technological advancements that led up to this case? Um, you know, what problems they were trying to solve and what kinds of positive impacts did the, the, did the company hope to achieve from this project, okay? Um, so not not all of these questions are going to directly apply to your case study because every case study just by its nature is very different. Uh, but these are just some questions that you can ask to kind of talk about some of the historical context on the way. Okay. All right. Next is the technological context, and and so this is this is the part that makes it engineering. Okay. Uh, and so when you talk about just ethics in general, there's tons of ethical case studies out there of people being ethical or non-ethical. Um, but you know, I want I want to limit our discussion for this class. The topics for this class are strictly engineering products, um, and so you know, there's there's going to be some kind of technology aspect to it. There's some kind of um, you know engineering aspect to it, and this is where you're going to discuss that. Okay, uh, as an example, and so you know, last time um, last time we met for ethics, we talked about the Ford Pinto, and so there's a very strong technical component in terms of you know why why the why the Ford engineers put the gas tank uh, where it is and why impacts um, you know to that part caused you know an explosion okay so there's you can you can compute you can you know analyze that from an, from a technological point of view you can analyze that from an engineering point of view um, and you can really talk about the technology of you know why or why not you know certain engineering decisions were made okay um, and so that's and so that's the idea behind this and so this is this is the this is the part where you can bring in, a lot of knowledge from outside uh, outside this course, you know, maybe um, knowledge from your other engineering courses that you've taken, um, and use that to kind of analyze, you know, this um, this part. Okay? And this is interesting too because a lot of the case studies that we'll look at uh, happen, you know, quite a, quite a bit in the past, and so technology has advanced quite a bit since then. And so one thing that you can talk about is, you know, why, you know, from a technological perspective, you know, why certain certain things were designed the way they are and you know how that's been improved over over the years as well okay all right next is economic and so this this relates to kind of the first part of the class and so um you know almost every engineering company out there you know the reason they engage in products is is to make money and so usually the economics the financials you know the revenue that's going to make a big impact in terms of you know how they decide or what decisions that they make okay and so feel free to use a lot of the techniques that we that we learned in the first part of class here too. And so, you know, if you have numbers in terms of, you know, what their expected sales were, um, you know, what the maintenance costs were, you know, how much the production costs were, um, if you had information on their tax, tax stuff. And so a lot of that, you know, especially for the, a lot of the really public cases, a lot of that information is out there. And so you can use things like rate of return analysis. You can use things like present worth analysis, annual cash flow uh, to really dive deep into you know, um, how much money did the company, you know, uh, invest in the project? How much money were they hoping to gain and how that kind of influenced their decision making? Okay. All right. Next is the personnel context. And so, you know, um, usually there are, you know, a few, I call them stars of the show. And so there are certain people usually in kind of a leadership or management position 
Um, sometimes they're the engineers too that are kind of key to this whole operation. And so you know they were the ones that made the decision to either push forward. They are the ones that you know that try to kind of game the system. And so I want to talk. I want you guys to talk about you know who who the major uh, who the major people were in this ethical uh, in this ethical dilemma, and you know and what their what their primary interests were and how that kind of influenced their decision making. Okay. Okay, and so you know all these context sessions uh, sections right here. That's that has to do with kind of the background of the uh, um, of the ethical lapse. Um, now you're going to describe you know what the ethical lapse is. Okay, and so you're going to describe here what happened. Okay, so why why is this ethical? Why is this a case study? So why are we studying it? Okay, and you're going to analyze it. Okay, uh, and so you know like we talked about on Tuesday, there's lots of different ways that you can analyze an ethical decision. And so first of all, you can use the professional codes of ethics. Um, you can use some of the ethical frameworks like utilitarianism, duties and rights ethics. Okay? Uh, and so I want you to analyze, you know, what the ethical dilemma was. And then finally, I want you to um, discuss what the impact of that ethical issue was. Okay. And so there's, you know, there's usually a pretty good reason why, you know, a lot of these case studies that we're, that we're looking at, why they've kind of become famous. And it's because they each of them have had kind of an impact on you know how we conduct engineering, whether certain laws were created after that, or whether you know certain things happened. And so there's always some kind of fallout. And then you know, kind of the end the the way engineers conducted ever since then has is usually going to be changed after these ethical issues because because a lot of them are so high profile. And so I want you to discuss you know what that impact is. Okay. Okay, and so after you kind of are, are, are finished analyzing what the ethical dilemma was, then I want you to discuss, you know, what are some possible alternate course of, courses of action that they could take, okay? Um, and, you know, I think a simple one that a lot of people will do for their case study is to say, you know, just don't do that, just, you know, be ethical. Uh, but I want you to kind of really put a lot of thought into this. And so, you know, you know, judging by, you know, everything that you learned in terms of the context, you know, what are like, what are some just realistic options that they could have done to avoid that situation, but still, you know, um, just still satisfy a lot of, you know, what they were trying to achieve. Okay. Uh, and so for these ones, I want you to predict, I want you to come up with at least three alternative courses of action. Um, and so, you know, this is, it's, it's going to be a lot more difficult than just saying, you know, just don't do that, just be an ethical person. And so, you know, you really have to kind of think pretty carefully in terms of, what you realistically could have done in those situations um, to change to change the outcome. Okay. Okay. Uh, and then and then the last section here is what I call outlook. And so, uh, you know, this 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 section I think will be interesting, um, especially for some of the more recent events, um, because you know I think the story is still being written on on those ones. And so, um, you know. I want you to discuss, you know, just based on everything that you've learned about this case study, you know, discuss what you think would happen in the future if a similar situation were to arise, uh, or if anything has changed since then to to prevent, you know, similar situations from arising like this in the future. Okay, um, and so you know that's something to think about. Okay, and then references, and so you know this is this is basically going to be a, a research a research report, and so you're going to be doing a lot of primary research. And so I want each member in your group to be responsible for, for, for finding at least three credible sources for your report, okay? And I have I have a website here that uh, can help you determine, you know, what a credible source is, although I think, you know, at this point, uh, I think everyone kind of knows what a credible source is. You know, I think most people here are juniors and seniors, um, but, you know, if you want a good reference, this is, this is a good one here. Um, and so make sure you're using, you know, credible sources and make sure you bring enough sources to, to the table, okay? All right, so any questions on the project uh, requirements? And yeah, definitely, and definitely, you know, feel free to use the um, the Discord chat. Uh, you know, we have the, uh, um, you know, we have the Zoom chat here. Yeah, you know, definitely use all of those at your disposal to help find groups, uh, especially because everyone in your group will have to agree on at least a few different project topics too, which we'll, which we'll talk about soon, okay? Okay. All right, so let's talk deliverables. And so there's four things that you're gonna have to submit. Um, two of them are major, and then two of them are just kind of making sure that everyone does their, their fair share, okay? Um, all right, and so uh, the first deliverable is what I call an agreement of shared responsibilities. Okay? And so anytime you do group work, uh, you know, it, it always becomes kind of an issue in terms of, you know, who's doing what, and, you know, whether it's a fair division of work. And so, you know, before you guys start working on anything, I want you guys to agree on you know who's 
doing what parts and to make sure that everyone kind of does their fair share. Okay. And so I've already laid out, you know, all the different project requirements for you here. And so, you know, before everyone begins, I want everyone to kind of, I want everyone in the group to say, you know, I'm going to do this part. I'm going to do this part. I'm going to do this part. And then kind of stick to that contract as you go through the, uh, the project. Okay. Uh, granted, you know, I know that, you know, it's, it's hard to, it, it's hard to really judge right now, like which parts are going to be more work or less work, but I want, I want you guys, I want you guys to have a document that you can hold each other accountable to, um, you know, and so if someone starts to ghost you, if someone starts to, um, you know, um, to leave, then you have that, you kind of have this contract that everyone needs to sign, um, you know, to, um, you know, to hold them accountable, okay, uh, and so, you know, another little typo here, so of course we don't have class on Friday the 18th, um, but I want you guys to submit this to me by the 18th. Okay, so I think that's Friday, Friday of next week. Okay. All right, so next to the final presentation. And so we talked about this briefly. And so um, the final presentation will take place during the last week of class, uh, not finals week, but the week before finals week. Okay. And so half the groups are going to go on Tuesday and the other half are going to go on Thursday. Okay. And so the presentation should be kind of a brief summary of the contents of your report. And so it should be, you know, roughly 15 to 17 minutes long. Uh, and each, of course, each group member should uh, speak equally. Okay, and so of course, you know, this is uh, this is the final presentation is going to take place about ten days before the final report is actually due. Um, and so, you know, I don't expect you guys to have your your report fully done by that point, but you should have enough to present the most important details, kind of in a clear and cohesive way. Okay, and so I, I expect, you know, after even after the final presentation, I still expect a, probably a lot of the work to be done. But you should have you should have done enough research and you should be able to kind of present it in a clear and accurate way. And that's the idea with the final presentation. OK, the reason I do them during the final week of, of lecture is to you know make sure that, you know, those are those are the only times that we have scheduled that everyone in the class can meet. And so I want, you know, I want everyone else to be able to see your uh, presentations uh, because a lot of these case studies are actually really interesting. And I think, you know, I think a lot of people will um, be really interested in learning from them. All right, and so after the final presentations, there's the final report, and so this is going to be the final deliverable, and, and this is where you're going to be graded on most of the points. Um, it should, and so it should have all the components above, and be written with clear and concise language. Okay, um, and so you know probably I know and I know probably what's going to happen is that you know especially based on the agreement of shared responsibilities, you know each person of the group is going to be writing the different sections of the report, um, but you know I still expect it to be you know. I still expect it to flow well. And so, you know, uh, you know, just very, just very basically, you know, I've had final reports where, you know, the different parts were submitted with different font color or different font sizes or different font, you know, styles. And so it's very obvious that, you know, it's just copy and paste. And so I do want it to be kind of one cohesive report, not, not only in the aesthetics, but, you know, it should kind of flow well too. Okay. And so that means that, you know, uh, at least one or two people are going to be responsible for compiling the whole report together. Um, and that and that actually is a pretty significant amount of work. And so don't discount that. And so when you're when you're putting together your agree, your agreement of shared responsibilities, uh, make sure you clearly define, you know, who's going to be responsible for compiling the report, doing the editing, you know, making sure it all flows together well and, you know, making and make sure that that's that's kind of a fair portion of, of the work. OK, because that, that is that does take quite a bit of time. And so, you know, if you if you've never done that for a group before, you know, it's, you know, Trust me when I say it, it takes it takes a while. You know, I've seen um, groups in the past where you know groups they didn't account for that in their final report or in their agreement of shared responsibilities, and then you know maybe one or two people in the group end up doing like fifty percent more work than everyone else because you know no one no one else helped with the, com the compilation of the uh, of the final report. Okay, and that goes for the presentation as well. And so you want to make sure that you know that the people who are putting those together are you know um, you know maybe they have less other work to do because they have you know. Putting it all together takes takes some work. Okay, and so the final due date for the final uh, for the final report is going to be Monday, December nineteenth, and so that's the Monday after finals week. Okay, um, and so you know I, I like to push the final due date back because I know you guys are going to be really busy during the finals week, and so I want to give you guys that extra bit of flexibility so you have kind of that extra weekend to work on it. Um, you know, of course, you know you're free to turn it in before that. You know, you don't have to wait until the deadline. Um, you know, but just in the interest of you know. Um, I know you guys are really busy. I want to give you guys just a couple extra days to finish it, you know, so you, you can really put your best work forward. OK, but with that said, you know, I, I really can't push it beyond this because um, I do like to get all my grading done before Christmas. 
Um, and so, you know, um, you guys aren't the only final project uh, course that I'm having. And so I'm having theirs do same day as well. And so, you know, just, just to make sure that I can, I can see my family and, uh, you know, during Christmas, I, 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 this is as far back as I can push it. And so, um, you know, please turn it in by this time. Um, you know, it's, it's very hard for me to kind of extend it kind of beyond, beyond this. Okay. All right, and then the final deliverable is uh, an assessment of shared responsibilities. And so, you know, after you finish the report, so after you finish all the work, I want you to write kind of a brief one page kind of description in terms of, you know, how the group actually worked together relative to the agreement of shared responsibilities above, okay? Um, and so, you know, um, in the best case scenario, you know, everyone kind of does their fair share and then everyone writes an assessment said, yeah, everyone did their own work. We're all happy, and then you know, then I can keep, I can give everyone full credit. Okay, um, and so you know, I want to bold this and say that you know, I do, I am going to take these assessments into account when assigning individual grades for the final project. Okay, and so uh, what I'm going to do is that you know, based, and so I have I have rubrics for the final presentation and the final report, uh, but based on the assessment of shared responsibilities, um, you know, if some people did more work or than than others. You know, I may give them more points or, you know, for the people that didn't do really any work, you know, I can take off a significant number of points. And so, you know, I, you know, you really need to do your fair share of work here and, and you know, and your group members are, and I expect your group members kind of hold you accountable for that. Okay. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of why I, I got you guys pick your own groups because, you know, I, I feel like it's, it's a little bit easier for, you know, for people that you know to kind of hold them accountable to make sure that, you know, they're all getting their work done. Okay. So, you know, the ideal case is that, you know, everyone just does their fair share and, you know, everyone puts in equal amount of work and, you know, I don't have to do any kind of adjustments, but every, every year, you know, I, I always have to do at least some adjustments of people's grades just because, um, you know, some people do more work, some people do less work um, and so on and so forth. Okay. But at the same time, you know, don't take this as a ticket of, you know, I'm going to I'm going to use this opportunity to get extra points by doing all the work. OK, so the ideal case is when everyone kind of does their fair share of work and not just one person just kind of goes solo and, and does the work on their own. OK, so, you know, I want you, I really want you guys to work as a team. And so it, it shouldn't just be, you know, one person trying to get all the glory or one person trying to do none of the work. OK, uh, and so these assessments will be due on the same day. And so these will be due on Monday, December 19th. Okay. All right, any questions on the on the deliverables for the final project? Okay. <clears throat> All right, and so the rest of this uh, is just, you know, the, the components of the final report. I think this will be, this is just kind of an outline of, of the requirements above, so I won't go through that. Uh, the teams are going to be four. Uh, I need to update this document. This is from last year. So last year I had a much bigger class. So this year I think we have about 32 students, 33. And so, you know, uh, groups of four are going to be, uh, you know, the limit. I'll, I'll revise this document and put it and put a, an, another one up there. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions about this, you know, it's it's going to be, you know, it's going to be kind of a hectic month. You, you have just about one little bit over one month to do it. Um, but you know, definitely don't feel don't be afraid to to look uh, to ask me for questions. Okay. All right. And so, um, besides that, I want to kind of review the the topics that are available. And so, I'm not going to go through each one in detail. Uh, but I do want to kind of briefly mention each one just so that you have an idea of, you know, um, the topics that are available. But also I want to mention that besides these, I think I have 15 of these, I have 15 topics. Um, you know, if there's a, if there's another case study that you want to look at that I don't have listed here, um, just run it by me. And then a lot of times I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy to, um, you know, if, if, it, if there's enough of an, if there's enough of an engineering component to it, um, then I'm more than happy to let you kind of work on what you want to work on. All right, so here are the topics, uh, just so just to give you some ideas of what you can work on. So uh, the first one here is fairly recent. So this is the Boeing 737 MAX. Uh, and so if, if you don't know about this, this is the Boeing aircraft that, um, you know, was, um, you know, the one of the one of the very deadly um, crashes that that occurred uh, mostly in Indonesia. Um, and so there's a, there's been a lot of ethical fallout from that. And so that's that's a very interesting case study. I have a, I have at least, you know, I think every year that I've done this project, there's always been one group that does this. But I think every year the kind of the situation has evolved a bit more. So, you know, this is this is really, really fascinating. Okay. Next, we have the Space Shuttle uh, Challenger. And so this is one of the uh, very famous um, aerospace disasters. Um, and so this is the one that broke apart um, at launch. And so about 73 seconds after it launched, uh, it killed all it the basically the rocket exploded and it killed all seven members 
Um, and it was kind of a result of a lot of the um, poor culture that was perpetuated in NASA at the time. Okay. All right, number three is Facebook and digital privacy. And so this is, I think, another one that's kind of evolving every single day. Um, and I'm not just going to limit it to Facebook. And so, you know, there's a lot of other apps and a lot of other service, um, social media services out there where, you know, there's a lot of privacy concerns. Uh, but this one in particular uh, has to do with um, a fairly big event that happened in March 2018 uh, with the leak that came from Cambridge Analytica. Okay. And so even though for this one, I say it's about Facebook and digital privacy, but, you know, you can feel free to kind of take this topic in a different direction because I know there's been other privacy concerns from other apps as well. Okay. Uh, four is Theranos. And so this is, this is an interesting one. And so there's actually, I think, like a, like a documentary that just was made about this, either on Netflix or HBO Max or something like that. Um, and so if you're not familiar about this, um, you know, there was a Stanford dropout. Her name was Elizabeth Holmes. And so she made this company um, ba basically based on a bogus technology. And so she, she, fakes a lot of, she faked a lot of the research results to make it seem like you know, her technology was really amazing at detecting diseases, but it was all made up and, you know, it's, it all kind of came crashing down on her head and there's still fallout to that to this day. And so, um, you know, that one's, that one's a very interesting one. Okay. Next one is called the Citicorp building. So this is actually one of the few, um, some may consider it a, a good story of, of ethical, um, of ethical, um, of engineering ethics, uh, which has to do with the construction of the Citicorp building in uh, downtown Manhattan. Um, and so there's a really interesting challenge in terms of, you know, how they had to build, um, the, the structure and, you know, and during the design phase, they actually didn't account for certain aspects, but they later went back and actually fixed it. And so some people consider this a good, a good thing. Um, but you can also look at it from, from a poor perspective too, where none of it was really publicized and they kind of put a lot of people at risk during the, uh, um, during the fix of the, of the building too. And so. Um, that's an interesting one. Okay. Uh, next, we have BF Goodrich um, and the Air Force A7D brake problem. And so this was um, kind of another, in, this was another instance of a company kind of, um, you know, lying about their test results to kind of earn a contract, to earn a job. Um, and so this was, uh, um, you know, a very interesting case. This is also one with a very prominent whistleblower. And so we'll talk about whistleblowers probably sometime next week and what that has to do with, um, you know, with engineering ethics. Okay. Next, we have the Aberdeen 3. And so I think this is, uh, I picked this one because it has to do with um, um, actually environmental ethics. And so this one has, uh, I think, probably one of the, the strongest environmental flavors. And so this has to do with a chemical plant in, uh, in Maryland, where uh, they were kind of um, illegally or unethically disposing of chemical waste, and that had kind of a negative effect on the environment. Next, we have Hurricane Katrina uh, and the New Orleans Hurricane Protection System. And so, um, you know, Hurricane Katrina, you know, I think is something that uh, happened through, you know, um, I think, you know, you guys, you guys are old enough. You, you guys probably lived through it. Maybe you guys were kids at the time. Um, but, you know, um, you know, what this uh, what this case study highlights is that, you know, there there could have been there could have been better protection, you know, based on um you know, the tools that they already had in place for protecting from hurricanes. And so you can kind of analyze that in terms of, and from the, uh, um, from an ethical point of view, okay? Next one is is one that hits pretty close to home for us here who live in California. So that's PG&E and California wildfires. Okay? Um, and so wildfires are becoming a bigger and bigger uh, problem, you know, each year in California. Uh, but PG&E, which is the um, the main power company up in up in Northern California, um, they have, they, they've been actually had, they've, they've actually had a very strong, um, you know, influence on this just kind of, um, due to the neglect and maintenance that they've, they've, they, they've done over the many years and all of the money that they've kind of taken from the state government to say that they would use to fix the issues, but they didn't. And so, um, this is also a very interesting one. You know, I have a group work on this almost every year, um, just cause I think it hits pretty close to home. So, you know, another great one. Next, we have ASME versus Hydro Level Corporation. And so this is a in an interesting one due to conflict of interest. Um, and so, um, you know, basically what, what happened for this one was that there was a company that was looking to sell a valve, but then a, a an executive from a rival company sat on kind of a regulatory board and prevented that company from, um, you know, releasing their valve where they made it very strict. 
Um, and so basically it was, it's an, it's an interesting case of conflict of interest where, you know, a direct competitor was able to leverage his position in a professional society to kind of put down uh, some competition. So um, kind of an interesting one for that. Uh, Love Canal. And so this, I think, a very interesting name. And so I think a lot of people like it for the name, but it has nothing to do with, uh, you know, it's, it's actually, it's actually another environmental case. Um, and so this has to do with, um, you know, again, kind of illegal disposal of, of chemical waste and how that affects kind of the, uh, um, the people that live in the area. Okay. And number 12 is the big dip, uh, big dig collapse. And so someone, another one that was fairly recent, 2006, um, where a big tunnel system in Boston collapsed, um, killing a couple of people. And it was later found out that the reason for the collapse was some negligence in the, uh, in the maintenance of the, of the tunnel. Okay. Number 13 is the Deepwater Horizon. So this one's also fairly recent. And so this is the, also known as the BP oil spill. Um, and so this happened, um, you know, I think maybe 10 years ago when there was a very large oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. And of course, this had massive environmental and financial ramifications. And I think what's 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 fascinating about this one is is kind of the PR job that BP did afterwards, because everyone kind of forgot that it was BP's fault <laughs> that, that that this happened, and you know they've kind of recreated their their public image since then, which is which which is really really fascinating. Um, next is the Fukushima nuclear accident. So this one's also fairly recent, 2011 when um, a nuclear reactor in Japan was struck by a tsunami and it caused almost a nuclear meltdown. Um, and again, this was a case of, you know, of negligent um, maintenance. Okay. Number 15 is uh, a very recent one. It has to do with deep fakes. Um, and so if you are not familiar, deep fakes is an emerging technology where a person can be basically edited to look like someone else and you know discussing kind of the potential ramifications for this and so this one's interesting because I, I think people find it really cool but there's also very little content there's very there's very little um sources on this one as well and so this one you're gonna have to do every every year someone a group does this because they think it's cool but they end up doing a lot more work than other groups just because it's, it's a lot harder to find information okay and of course you know there's other topics as well all right, and so um, you know those are those are fifteen topics, and so um, you can pick any of the fifteen. Um, but you know, like I mentioned before, I don't want two groups working on the same topic. And so um, the way I'm going to do this this year is that I want you guys to form your own groups first, um, and so you know, find you know find three other people that you want to work with, and then I want you um, four as a group to email me um, you know the topics that you the the give me three topics that you want to work on. So send me kind of your top three. And then once I have all the groups in, I'll assign the topics based on you know who emailed me first. Okay. And so what I did last year was I, I kind of did an open sign up, and so I, I basically made a Google sheet and I let people sign up. But then there were some issues of like people deleting other people's names and putting their own names in, and and you know it was it was kind of a mess. And so I think this year I'm, I'm just going to uh, just going to handle it myself. And so uh, what you need to do is you know form your form your groups. Um, send me a list of your top three topics, and then based on you know which groups kind of email me first, I'll give you kind of your your top choices of topics. But if one is taken, I'll move down your list and and give you another one. Okay. All right. And so that's all the topics. And so are there are there any questions on on any of this? Okay. All right, and so you know that's that's the final project, and so there's there's quite a bit components to it, but you know it's 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 going to be interesting, you know, and I and I think people generally enjoy this this final project because because it's it's really interesting to learn about um, you know all these different case studies, um, you know, and, and I think it's good to have it's good to have some kind of historical knowledge of, of you know of these kinds of topics as as a professional engineer. Okay, all right. So with that said, you know that's the final project. But you know, I, I do want to kind of give you a chance to practice this on your own as well. Okay, so this is homework six, and so this has also been posted to to Canvas. Okay. Um, and so, um, and so, you know, even though even though you guys are going to be working on the final projects, you know, I want everyone to do some kind of uh, writing report. Uh, right, and so this is going to be an individual project. So the final project is a group project, but homework six is going to be individual okay um and so for homework six i basically want you to do kind of a miniature version of the final project and so it's not it's not going to be absolutely everything and so i've 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 cut out you know most of the you know a lot of the kind of the extra stuff 
for the uh, for the final project. Uh, but I do want you to talk about things like historical context, personnel context, uh, what the ethical issue was, and give me a an alternative course of action. Okay. And for this one, you have a different list of um, of ethical case studies to look at. Okay. And so these three case studies, they're not part of the final project list, but they are part of your uh, homework six. Okay. So I want you to choose one of these three and then and then kind of basically write an individual report on these just so that you can get some practice on writing this um, before you start to work on the final project okay and so the three topics for this are the columbia space shuttle disaster and so this is kind of the other kind of really big um, aerospace disaster and so this was a space shuttle that disintegrated on re-entry uh, into the uh, into the um into the earth okay next is the kansas city hyatt regency walkway collapse and so um this one this one is um very fascinating in that it was a very kind of grand collapse and so in 1980 there's a you know a brand new height regency um, that opened in kansas city missouri um but the the walkways were actually very poorly designed due to a lot of neglect and so when they when they opened the the hotel they actually had uh, a bunch of people dancing on the walkways but during that performance the entire thing collapsed and it, and it killed you know a just a ton of people from that. And so it's very sad, but also, you know, um, it kind of was a, a very spectacular failure. Yeah. And number three is the Ford Pinto. And, you know, I think everyone, I think we all know about the Ford Pinto at this point. Okay. And so, you know, I do want you guys. And so, you know, this, this is an individual writing report. And so this is going to be due on Sunday, no, November 20th. Um, and so the reason I'm having this is so that, um, you know, over the Thanksgiving break, I'm going to be grading your individual writing reports. And uh, I'm going to give you comments and feedback, okay? Um, because you know the final project, it's it's a fairly lengthy report, and so I think in the specs I said that it's it's gonna, probably going to be around 30 to 40 pages, and so I don't want you to embark on something that massive without any kind of feedback from me, because we haven't done any kind of writing assignments in this class at all, and so kind of the idea with homework six is that you kind of try it out first. It's a lot lower stakes because it, it goes in the same category as, as all the other homeworks. Uh, but at the same time, you know, you, you're able to get some feedback and some comments from me and then incorporate that into your final into your final project. OK, just so that, you know, by the time you write your final project, you have some kind of idea of, you know, what I'm looking for, or how I'm going to grade it uh, in terms of that. OK. All right. So a lot of a lot of stuff. And so, you know, a lot of assignments. But this is but this is basically all the assignments that we're going to do with regards to ethic, with regards to the ethics portion. And so there's going to be homework six. And then there's going to be the final project and, and that's and that's it and so after that there's there's no more assignments and there's no more you know things to turn in in this class after, besides these two things that we talked about today okay all right any questions about anything so final project homework six or anything like that uh i could try doing a google form oh yeah that's a good idea so yeah maybe maybe i'll do a google form um for the for the projects um but for now you know if you if you already know who you're going to work with just go ahead and email me um you're with your with everyone in the group and then just let me know what what topic you want to do okay uh question do i drop uh the lowest score on homework i do uh but homework six is exempt and so homework six is the one i'm i'm not going to drop yeah and so i'll drop i'll drop your lowest economics homework but not but not homework six All right, and so thank you guys. Uh, thank you guys for listening to all that. So it actually took us 40 minutes to go over everything, but hopefully, you know, hopefully it makes everything clear. You know, hopefully, you know, um, you have a good idea of what you want to do, and you kind of start forming your groups. Okay, so kind of remember the kind of the sooner you form your groups, the sooner you email me, kind of the 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 better uh, chance you get to um, you know getting the topic that you want. Okay. Okay. All right. So let's me, let me come back to the to the iPad here. All right, and so let's go ahead and continue our discussion. And so, um, you know, the the topic for today is going to be risk and safety. Okay. All right. And so, you know, 
like we talked about um, last time, you know, and, and like we just talked about just now, you know, there's there's a significant ethical portion to engineering work, um, you know, that you kind of always need to keep in mind as you're conducting, um, you know, professional engineering work. OK, and more than any other ethical topic that we're going to cover, um, you know, for the rest of court or the rest of the course, kind of health and safety are kind of the, always going to be the number one priority. OK. And so, you know, I would I would say that, you know, there is a duty. Um, there is a duty for, uh, you know, uh, for professional engineers to protect the health and safety of the people that are using their products. Because, okay? you know, uh, more often than not, people are going to be spending their hard earned money on on your engineering products. And so, um, you know, they deserve their the health and safety to be um, to be protected. OK. All right. And so, um, you know, think about just think about, you know, all the other times you use kind of a product of, of engineering. Okay, uh, And so every day, you know, we, we use products that, you know, we expect are going to keep us safe. Right. And so, you know, on just, um, you know, just a few examples. And so, you know, when you're driving to school, you're driving around uh, town, you know, you expect the engine and the brakes on our on our car to be, you know, um, to be working well. Okay. And so, you know, you don't expect to be driving on the freeway and your brakes just suddenly just give out on you and then, you know, for your car to crash into something, right? Um, when you get into an elevator, you expect the elevator to just not just start hurtling towards, you know, um, hurtling towards the ground, right? Um, you expect it to kind of carry you up and down the building with safety, okay? Um, and, you know, when we use our phones every day, and so when you use your phone, um, you know, to make a call or to, you know, if you're going to use an app, you expect it to just not spontaneously explode in your hand, right? And so whenever you use anything, there's always an expectation of, of safety, right? And so, you know, I think one thing that you'll realize when you become a professional engineer is that you're going to be the one that's going to be responsible for, you know, whether or not your product is going to be safe or not, okay? Okay. All right, but at the same time, you know, we just like we talked about last time, they there is it's impossible to make something 100% safe. And so, you know, even even, you know, when I move my mouse right here, right? There's there's no guarantee. There's no 100% guarantee that my I'm going to be safe, right? I might, you know, suddenly just like break my wrist, you know, trying to move my mouse, right? And so, you know, that's 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 never going to be the goal for you to make things 100% safe because that's that's impossible okay Right, because even even the most mundane task, you know, can be, um, you know, can be the victim of a of a of just a freak accident or any kind of freak misfortune. Okay, and so if you've ever seen, um, you know, some of those uh, some of those uh, thriller movies like Black Mirror or, or Final Destination, you know, you probably know you probably know what I'm talking about. And so, you know, those those are mostly fantasy, but you know, freak accidents like those do occur, and and sometimes you know, there's really nothing you can do about it. And so, you know, when I say that, it's 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 as a professional engineer, it, it's our duty to ensure the safety of, of the people that use our products. It's not that we have to prevent every bad thing from happening, right? That's that's impossible. But what we should do is that we should kind of do our due diligence and we should 
uh, do the best we can to maximize the safety as well as reduce the risks as much as possible. Okay. Okay. And that's really the key. And so, um, you know, you, you, you have to basically be able to prove that, um, you know, when you, when you are creating a product, when you are going through des the design of an engineering, uh, you know, um, you know, project that you are doing everything that you can and you're, you're minimizing that risk as, as much as humanly possible. Okay. Uh, impossible to eliminate all the risk, but, you know, you can do, you know, there's a lot of, you can, there's a lot that you can do. Um, to minimize that. And later on today, you know, we'll talk about, you know, def like four different approaches that you can take um, to kind of make sure that you're designing your products with safety in mind. Okay. Uh, any questions on, on this? Okay. All right. So let's, uh, so let's define some terms. So just, just very basic terms that have to do with, um, with risk and safety. Okay. And so first let's define risk. All right, so when I talk about risk, uh, risk basically just refers to the possibility of danger or harm. Okay, pretty straightforward. Okay, next we have safety. And so safety is uh, freedom from risk, basically. So freedom from damage, injury, or risk. Okay. It's a very basic. And so, you know, I think people, everyone generally, you know, probably understands those definitions already. Um, but you know, it, it's it just for the sake of completeness, it's it's good to kind of um, mention those again, right? And so when you put it like that, you know, it's it's it sounds very simple, right? And so you know, whether you're hurt or not, and the risk is basically just the pro the probability of that. Uh, but with anything, you know, there's a lot of nuance and there's a lot of different um, kind of ways that you can kind of uh, think about this additionally. Okay, so let's let's add some kind of nuance to this. And so number one, and so there's a difference between uh, what we consider voluntary risk versus involuntary risk. And so probably, you know, everyone has experienced this to some degree. And so, you know, let's say that you go to an amusement park or maybe you go to some kind of event and they force you to sign a waiver, um, you know, before you can before you can uh, participate in that event. Right. And so I think very recently I, I went to this uh, I rented I went to this place in Hacienda Heights called Spocha. And so they it's, they, they basically have all different kinds of like roller skating and, and all that stuff in there. And so before you can even enter the facility, they, they make you sign a waiver to say that, you know, uh, you might get hurt. You might, you know, slip on a banana peel or something and, and throw out your back. Uh, they have batting cages there. And so, you know, you might get hit in the head with a baseball. And so, you know, they uh, they they basically have a very long document that literally nobody reads, but, you know, they have to provide it anyway in terms of, um, you know, what uh, what kind of risk and what kinds of health concerns that you can have for going in. Okay. But the idea is that, you know, if if you're made aware and if you kind of understand all the different risks and all the different health concerns that are going into a um, before going into a situation, you're more likely to um, kind of view those as acceptable risks. OK. And so one way that we can say that is that the perceived safety of a situation is um, is higher if the risks are known and voluntarily accepted.
right? And so that's the reason we have waivers. Is you know, um, their you know, the original intent of a waiver is to kind of inform people. You know, these are the different ways that you can get hurt in these situations, and then to have them kind of voluntarily accept that. Okay, it's kind of evolved now, and so you know, like I said, no one really reads the waivers because they're written by lawyers. And they are probably like 10 pages long and no one's going to want to read that, especially when you have like a huge ass line of people behind you. You know, you're not going to you're not going to take the time to read all that because the people behind you are going to get upset. And so, you know, now they've kind of kind of become more of like a, a shield from some lawsuits. But, you know, the kind of the intent of waivers was to kind of inform people beforehand, you know, what their risks are and then to kind of have them make a choice whether they want to accept those risks or not. OK, and the idea is that, you know, if you if you do accept those risks, if you are kind of um, well informed, then you kind of know a bit better how to kind of avoid those situations and to perceive the safety is higher. OK. Another example um, for this is that, you know, can, let's say you're considering purchasing a home um, and uh, one of the homes that you're considering is next to a very large chemical plant that's known to kind of emit toxic chemicals or toxic waste into the air. OK. Or maybe something more realistic, you know, I, I think uh, one one thing that people consider is, you know, people generally don't want to buy a house next to a, a major power line. OK, and so the perceived risk is that, you know, those power lines are going to be emitting um, electromagnetic radiation. And then when you're in your home, it's going to kind of put you at risk for um, for various health concerns. And so generally what you see is that the homes that are next to large power lines uh, tend to have lower property values because you know people generally don't want to live there okay but if you are purchasing that home and you kind of know those risks um then you're kind of more likely to be okay with it because you know you knew the risk coming in and you voluntarily accepted it and you know if you get um you know if you get sick from the radiation then that's that's something that's kind of your choice okay uh, but you know if you're in a situation where you get hurt or you get harmed uh, and it was from something that you weren't aware of then you know it's it's usually a, a much worse outcome. Okay. Um, and so generally, you know, when when you design your engineering products, you know, you want to kind of be aware of you know what are the risks and to make sure that you know your users or the people that are are are, are using your product are aware of those risks and that they voluntarily accept them. Okay. All right, number two. Uh, so number two is uh, short-term versus long-term consequences. Okay. Uh, and so of course, you know, for situations when um, you do incur some kind of harm. Uh, situations where the negative effects are short term are perceived as less risky than those that have longer term effects. Okay. Uh, so that was pretty um, straightforward. Okay. okay. Uh, next is expected probability. So this one's very interesting because uh, people usually make decisions in terms of uh, you know, how likely something is going to happen, um, but maybe not necessarily the severity of, of what's happening, okay? Uh, and so and so generally speaking, if the probability of, of an incident is low enough, uh, people are more willing to take that risk, even if the consequences can be dire, okay? I should say probability.
Uh, but on the flip side, you know, if there if there's a high probability of, of a uh, of an accident occurring, but the consequences are only minor, then this actually ends up pushing more people away. And so, you know, um, generally people kind of view safety accidents as kind of uh, black and white. And so, you know, it's whether you know something happens to me or, or not. And so, um, you know, it's usually not until something happens that people really kind of consider the severity of, of what's of what's happening. Okay, so that one, so that one's very interesting. And so. You know, and so, you know, I think it's an interesting question that you would ask that you could ask yourself that, you know, if there is a low chance that something will happen, but if something does happen, it's going to be fairly major versus a higher probability of something happening, but it's fairly minor, you know, which which one are you going to which one are going to be more likely to to do? OK, uh, you may say neither. <laughs> so you may say, you know, I wouldn't want to risk anything. And that's and that's perfectly fine, too. But, you know, it's an, it's an interesting um, it's an interesting, I think, nuance to, you know, how people view, um, you know, risk, risk and safety. Okay, next is reversible effects. And so if you if you do sustain consequences, but they can be reversed um, fairly easily, then um, then people generally view it as less risky because they can always fix it later. Uh, so that one's fairly straightforward. All right, and the last uh, piece of nuance that we'll go for is uh, delayed versus immediate risk. Uh, and so if you're if you're in a situation where, um, you know, any kind of consequences that you may face are not going to be felt for many years in the future, you are probably going to see that as less risky than something with immediate consequence. Okay. And so I, I just can, I just uh, you know did something exactly like that today. And so um, you know gen generally speaking, um, you know, and, and I'm sure a lot of faculty kind of feel the same way. But our, our physical health has has been deteriorating kind of the longer and longer we, we work in this job. And so you know before this, um, you know, I was having kind of a rough week. My dryer was uh, not working. I'm behind on a lot of grading and everything. So I ate an ice cream sandwich. Um, it was delicious, but, you know, I know that uh, the me in a few years is probably going to kick myself because, you know, my blood pressure is not doing great <laughs> and my uh, uh, my cholesterol is not doing great. So, you know, it's something that, you know, immediately gives me a lot of joy. You know, eating an ice cream sandwich uh, kind of relieves some of the immediate stress that I'm feeling, but, you know, it's not definitely not good for my long term health. And so, you know, but I, I see it as kind of a less risky behavior because I'm not going to feel the effects of this ice cream sandwich for another, you know, 10 years or so. And so, you know, um, definitely something that's risky, but, you know, not something that's going to, not something that's going to affect me today. Okay. All right. Uh, any questions on, on this? Okay. All right. And so, and so this is just some examples in terms of, uh, you know, how risk and safety are, you know, actually very nuanced. And so what may seem like a very kind of straightforward topic there's lots of different kinds of ways that you know there's there's complexity in terms of, uh, that that gets introduced and way and different ways that people different people perceive it okay and everyone's a little bit different too and so not everyone's going to view the same situation um, the same as someone else because you know they're weighing different things um, at the same time you know, they may be in different stages of their life they may have experienced different things that kind of have affected their perception of safety. And so it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a very interesting topic that, you know, it's, it's going to be different and it's going to, of course, going to be different for every engineering product that you're going to design as well. 
right? And so it's important to kind of think about all these um, all these different things. Okay? okay, and so that kind of begs the question. And so you know, with with all these different kinds of concerns, with all these different kinds of health and safety issues, you know, how do you actually go about designing a safe engineering product? Okay. Um, and so the answer to this question, you know, is it's it's very, very kind of product specific, very field, uh, field specific, because how you design, you know, let's say how you design a, a safe, you know, computer mouse, that process is going to be a lot different than how you design a safe airplane, right? And so there's a lot more uh, safety checks and there's a lot more kind of rigorous engineering that you have to do for an airplane. Uh, which kind of naturally is is more risky than using a computer mouse. Okay, and so this this four step process here that uh, that I'm going to um, that I'm going to outline, first of all, is very general, and so it, you know it's not specific to any kind of of product or very kind of engineering, um, but you know these are kind of four generally good steps to follow along your engineering um, uh, process, no matter what kind of engineering product you design. Okay, so these are kind of four kind of good steps to always do. Okay. All right, number one. So number one is to comply with any applicable laws. Okay. Uh, so first step, generally a good step, you know, um, for your daily life as well is to follow the law, okay? Uh, and so, you know, before you do anything, you have to make sure that your engineering product or engineering project that you're working on is going to comply with any any laws and it's not going to be breaking with any. Okay. And so, you know, part of the government's responsibility is to pass laws because, uh, you know, it's also partially the government's responsibility to ensure the health and safety of their citizens. And so part of that is, is you know, health and safety of, you know, when they're when they're using engineering products. And so a lot of times they're going to be passing laws to ensure that, um, you know, uh, to make sure that the products that you use are, are safe. OK. Um, and so this is the first step. And so, you know, you want to make sure that, you know, whatever um, you know, whichever product that you are designing is going to follow the law. Because if it's not, then, you know, people can sue you and because you broke the law, right? And so that's usually not a good thing. Okay. All right, number two. Uh, number two is to, once you kind of made sure that you've, uh, you've complied with the laws, and most of the time, that's not, that's not terribly difficult to comply with the laws. Of course, it's, it's different for every, for different, every, every different engineering, you know, field. You know, there, excuse me, there are some fields that are kind of more in the public spotlight than others. And so they they might have more stringent laws uh, applied to them. Um, but generally speaking, you know, following the laws is, is not that difficult, you know, as, as kind of evidenced by the Ford Pinto. Okay. And so step two is that once you made sure that your engineering design, your engineering product uh, complies with the laws, step two is to make sure you comply with what's considered accepted engineering practice. Okay. And so uh, accepted engineering practice, I kind of put in quotes because, you know, it's it's not like it's the government where there's kind of a single governing body and it's, it's very easy to point to, you know, who's going to be enforcing those um, those laws. 
you know, en accepted engineering practice usually has to do with, you know, uh, complying with the rules of the professional engineering society. Okay. Okay. And so a lot of professional engineering societies have uh, certain guidelines in terms of, you know, how um, certain things are, are to be done. Okay. Um, and so when you're designing, you know, when you're designing something that's like a pressure vessel, and so there's, there's different ways that, you know, let's say ASME has um, defined how that should be done in terms of, you know, how many bolts you should have, how much pressure it can hold, things like, things like that. Okay. And so you want to make sure that you, you also follow these guidelines as, as well. So generally speaking, um, the engineering standards or engineering practice are going to be uh, more stringent than the laws. And so this is going to be a little bit more difficult than, uh, than step one. Okay. And the reason for this is that, you know, these uh, these professional societies and their guidelines, they don't have to be subjected to the entire kind of legislative process that you need to write a new law in, in step one. OK, uh, as an example, you know, if you, you know, and, and hopefully you all voted. And so you better all freaking vote because, you know, we young people like us, we always get blamed when laws don't, don't work out. So make sure you guys are voting. I don't care who you vote for, but just 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 vote. Um, but if you if you kind of followed the past California elections, um, there's a certain group of people that have tried been passed that that have been trying to pass a law uh, regarding dialysis to make sure that a medical professional is there when people undergo dialysis. And it's been a proposition on the on the on the California ballot for like many, many years, um, but it still hasn't passed. And so, you know, um, making sure, you know, trying to get a law passed is very, very difficult. And so. Um, you know, usually it's a lot easier for these uh, for these uh, professional engineering societies kind of release their own guidelines, and they could be a bit more swift, and they can be kind of update their guidelines a bit faster than than the legislative process. And so, generally speaking, um, you know, the engineering practices they're going to be more stringent just because they're they're a little bit easier to change, they're a little bit easier to adapt with with the types. Okay. Okay. And so that means that you know part of your responsibility as an engineer. Um, um oh uh oh that's a that's a one yeah mm -hmm. um and so you know part of it you know part of, of what number two means is that you know it's it's your responsibility to be up to date on the professional guidelines and professional standards of of the engineering societies because those because those can change and so i think generally speaking you know a lot of the professional societies they update their guidelines you know, sometimes once a year, but sometimes every two years, three years. And so, you know, when those change, you know, it's partially your responsibility to make sure that you're up to date on those on those changes. Okay. Number three, and so I'll do number three and four um, a little bit quickly, just because we're almost out of time. Uh, but number three is to explore um, safer designs. Okay. And so number three is something that you, um, 
you know, you, you should always be looking at. And so just because just because something has been done a certain way for many, many years doesn't mean that it can't be improved because, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's not directly within your field, but there's new technologies and new breakthroughs that are being discovered, you know, almost every day. And so it's, it's always a good idea to, you know, to look and see, you know, what other people have discovered, how other people are doing things to see if you can use that information to improve your own product. OK, so it's always useful to explore safer designs because things can always be safer. And so you're never, you know, like I mentioned before, you're never going to reach 100 percent safety on anything, but you can get closer and closer to 100. Um, and sometimes that that sometimes that involves, you know, completely changing design or, or making a major design change. And so number three is something you can always consider. OK. Right. And number four is to uh, predict potential misuses of your product by uh, consumers. And so, you know, one thing that to always remember when you're designing an engineering product, or maybe you're writing like a, a computer science code or anything like that, is that your consumers or the people using your products are not going to be engineers, and they're not going to have the same level of technical knowledge that, that you have. And so, you know, what may seem to be like an obvious thing to you is, is totally not going to be an obvious thing to somebody else. And so, you know, one thing to always remember is that, you know, to whenever you design something to think about how can someone misuse this and will they put their safety at risk if they potentially misuse that okay um and so this this is an interesting one because i think you know when a lot of when a lot of engineers they design a product you know they may look and see you know some of the dumbass stuff that people do with their products and say that's you know that's not my responsibility you know how was i supposed to predict that someone was going to hit someone else on the head with that product right um, but, you know, it turns out, you know, sometimes it is your responsibility to, to do those things and to think about, you know, what are some of the ways that people are going to misuse your product and, you know, to think about, you know, how can you design your product to make sure that even if they do misuse it, um, is their safety still going to be protected to a reasonable extent? Okay. All right. Any final questions on, on any of this? Okay. All right. So that's all we got time for today. And so thank you guys for uh, for joining virtually. And so you know, um, you know, the repairman's not here yet, but you know, probably he's going to come pretty soon. Um, so and so remember the the final project information is out there. So you know, please form your groups. Um, email me as soon as you have a group together, and and uh, you know, you find uh, the topics that you want to look at, and uh, you know, and so I can start assigning them because you know we have just a little bit over a month to work on everything, and so I want to make sure that you guys have enough time to you know do the research do the writing and to kind of put together a presentation and report that that you can be proud of. Okay. Uh, and if you have any questions, of course, you can let me know. And so I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your day and I will see you all on Thursday. Yeah. Yeah, MJ. It, it, yeah, uh, you can go ahead. Uh, you can go ahead and talk. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh...